Good morning, everyone. Welcome to EFC Entrepreneur for Christ. I'm saying good morning to our friends in Zoom world too. Let's see how many people we have. Right now we've got one, two, two. They tend to come in after I open up. Here we go. I'm going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time we could be here, Lord, in our Entrepreneuring for Christ class. I thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. I thank you for all the good things that you give us, even things that we don't want, Lord. You still pass them down to us, Lord. And then you just teach us how to take care of them and do what we need to do in your name, Lord. I thank you for our class and our church skyline, Lord. And I just pray for the leadership here and in our communities, Lord. And, and just bless each one of us as we take words of wisdom that are given to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And with that, I'm going to introduce our honorable mayor of El Cajon, Bill Wells. Good morning. Can I stand? You can, you can sit or stand. It's your choice. All right. Hi, everybody. How are you? So I am the mayor of the city. And before I get started this little lecture that I got. I got to. I got to warn you. I, you're you're my guinea pigs because I, I I I've been working on this this part in my in my head. I, I gave it last night at, at a gathering that I wanted to, and I want to practice on you guys today because I think it's really important. But you know, first off, it's interesting that God has a sense of humor, uh, and I'll tell you a story. When I was growing up. Uh, it, my dad died when I was young, so it's just my mom and my sister and I. And we were living down in Southeast San Diego, and all my, my friends were getting in trouble and going to juvenile hall. My mom said, you know, we need to get you out of here. She so moved me to Ranch Bernardo. I don't know if you know Ranch Bernardo is, but Ranch Bernardo, from the difference between Southeast San Diego and Ranch Bernardo is like going to another country. Everything was clean and nice, you know. All my friends were getting ready to go to college, and their dads were CFOs and CEOs. You know, it was a huge difference for me. And uh, I loved it. I got involved in sports, I got involved in the paper, I was involved in music, I was doing everything. Things I would never have done before I was living before. But my mom didn't realize how far away it was from normal life for her. And about a year after we got there, she started with the El Cajon stuff. She, she started saying, hey, let's move to El Cajon. And I said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to El Cajon. Of all places, I'm not going to El Cajon. And, and she, she said, well, it would be better for me. But, you know, I'd meet more people. I'd be closer to my work, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I didn't care. I was like, no, this is the best my life has ever been. I have stayed here. You go to El Cajon. So then I, uh, I graduated college, and she did move to Elko. And I, I started San Diego State. And you know, I never wanted to go to Elko. My friends would say, let's go to Elko for this or that. And so I said, I don't want to go to Elko. I, I have no interest. And then I met my wife, Betty. Well, I knew Betty. And uh, we decided to get married. I said, hey, we should live in Ranch Bernardo. It's great. <laughs> It's a great place. It's a great place to live. You, know, you raise kids there. It's clean. It's wonderful. And she said, "No, we're going to live the home." And I said, "Okay." Yeah. So it, it was. It, it, all her family is is there, and so God take me dragging, uh, kicking and screaming to alcohol. I did not want to go, and then down the bear, which I think is really ironic. But I've grown to love alcohol. God moves in mysterious ways. And, you know, El Cajon is a very different kind of political place. When did you move to El Cajon? Oh, it was uh, about 93. So it's been a... 
Well, we've, we've done a lot to make it better. <laughs> but Elkhorn is a little bit different than most places uh, politically in California. Uh, we have five members of the city council, including me, that are all conservative Christians, which I don't think you're going to find any other places here in the county. I bet you you're not going to find that anywhere in California. Uh, California and San Diego has gone so far left and so uh, antithetical to Christian thought and, and so hostile to Christianity. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is the hostility that is happening in the entire world. Specifically, though, in the United States of America, and California is leading the way in that hostility. And I want to take you back to 1789, and that was the beginning of the French Revolution. Now, a lot of people don't know much about the French Revolution. I didn't know a whole lot about the French Revolution, but I, I started studying it because it was it becoming clear to me that there were significant parallels between what was happening in America that day and what was happening in France in the late uh, 18th century. And what happened was there was an uprising in France and they, they separated people by class. It, it was the, the have-nots against the haves. It was the people without pedigrees against the aristocrats. And the, the peasants, the, the people that had no um, really high standing in society, they took over the country and they threw the aristocrats out to kill most of them. And they decided that what they needed to do was to reshape the country from the ground up. They pulled down all the statues. They, they rewrote all the history. They burned the history books. Anybody who was against the, the movement, the revolution, which became like a religion to them, you, so you couldn't speak out against the revolution. If you did, you were a heretic. You had to be murdered. And that's where the, the guillotine was invented. The, the, that's what the French Revolution probably is most famous for is guillotining people in the streets. They went so far with this as they changed the names of the days of the week. They also changed the week from seven days to 10 days. They changed the, the entire calendar. Um, they forbid anybody to worship the Christian God or the Judeo Christian God. They turned all the cathedrals into horse stages to show them the state for Christianity. They murdered nuns and priests in the streets by cutting their heads off. They went so far as to make a new God, or a goddess actually, the goddess of reason. And you had to worship the goddess of reason. But it didn't last very long. It lasted 10 years. And then Napoleon came back and it took over. And it went somewhat back to where it used to be, but never quite back to, to the way it was. And uh, it really morphed into the socialism that you, that you see in France right now. And the, the real antip antipathy that they have for uh, Christianity. Um, so why do I tell you about the French Revolution? Because I believe that the same demonic spirit that led the French Revolution is now leading America into areas that are dividing us. Now, they're not dividing us by money and class right They're dividing us in other ways. They're dividing us along political ideological lines. So we saw that after the election, right? They, they started talking about Anybody who voted for Trump had to be punished. Anybody who voted for Trump, he had to be censored. If, if you voted for Trump, this didn't happen, but there, there's a lot of talk about, well, we should take the children away from those people and put them in re-education camps and, and try to save them from this, this evil ideology that would lead people to vote for this monster named Donald Trump. So the, how are they dividing us right now? A lot of it has to do with race. Uh, they uh, are with the media being complicit and the, the big tech companies. They are doing everything they can to get Americans against each other by race. They want 
me to hate you. They want you to hate me. And the only thing that can really separate that is, is a loving God. As Christians, we, we, we transcend those tribal instincts to hate people that, that don't look like me, hate people that dress differently, they hate people that have a, a different outlook on life because, because of their heritage, which I think is fun. I think it's great for people to have different heritages and dress differently. But right now, uh, because of critical race theory, because of, of Black Lives Matter, which is rooted, by the way, in Marxism, and we can talk a little, a little bit about what Marxism leads us to. But the media and the left-wing politics are doing a great job of fomenting hatred between groups of people and distrust. So where people used to have a pretty good relationship with each other, though, now it's based on hatred and distrust and fear. And I believe that they will use that wedge, that division, to cause some kind of a war that is going to tear America down. And we can tell that they want to tear America down. They're pulling down statues. And they're, they're renaming the names of schools. People like George Washington in, are, are now outlawed because he was a slave owner. Nobody looks at the fact that back in the, uh, the 1700s, there were actually more white people sold to uh, the Ottoman Turks than there were black people sold to America. The whole, I just want to make clear, the entire concept of slavery is abhorrent to me. It, it, it's so disgusting to me. And frankly, the whole concept of racism is disgusting to me. And it's, um, it insults my intelligence. I think if you're a, a thinking person, you're going to be more like Martin Luther King, who is looking for quality amongst people. Martin Luther King wasn't looking to supplant the white race with the black race. He was looking for a, a place where we could all live together in harmony. He was looking for a time when a man would be judged by the content of his character, not the color of his skin. But that's why even you might see, even if you quote Martin Luther King on Facebook or Twitter, you'll get a barrage of hate from the left because now Kip Martin Luther King has been canceled as well. <laughs> so the reason I bring all this up is because I have come to the conclusion that this is not just a ripple of time. We've had lots of problems in America where, where we have these, these periods of time where, where it seems like there's tension growing and, and there's problems. We've had, you know, we had the, uh, the LA riots. We had the uh, civil rights movement where uh, black Americans were treated horribly with Jim Crow laws. All those things, were serious problems, but they didn't have the, the universal implications, I think, that we see right now. And so I'm a, I'm a mayor of a, a moderately sized city. And I want to tell you as Christians something, that if you want to save your country, you've got to get involved. It, the time has passed where you can look to elected officials to fix your problems for you. We want to, some of us, but we're outnumbered. We're outnumbered in a big way, and it's overwhelming. And nobody hears our voice. They just drown us out. The only way that you're going to be heard is if you actually speak yourself. So I'm on Sandag, which is the San Diego Association of Government, and I'm on the Elkhorn City Council. And in both those organizations, every time we have a meeting, activists that want to tear us down and rebuild us on a Marxist society, there's 30 or 40 of them there every time fighting for their, for their cause. They don't sleep. They don't rest. 
They know that they've got to be politically active. They know that they're selling that. And they're selling something that people generally are not okay with. If they think about it, they, they're, they, they like the barrier. Most people, even though there's, there's problems, I think most people feel like America is the greatest country on the face of the earth and it's the best place to live to raise a family. But they don't want to lose that. They don't want to lose their freedoms. They don't want to be in the midst of a racial war. They want harmony. They want peace. But I don't see anybody on the, the Christian side of things at any of these meetings. All we get are the activists that, that hate America. There's not one voice from people who love America. There's not one voice from people who love God. So what happens? Well, they, they, they say, we're gonna do this radical thing and there's and, and all the people on the left that are there cheer along and say, yeah, yeah, that's great, that's great, let's do that. Let's, let's tear everything down. And you know, they basically say, is there anybody in opposition? No, there's nobody. So my challenge to you, is to organize your friends, organize your family, organize your neighbors, organize the people you go to work with, and pick something, a school board meeting, a city council meeting, a say of the hand meeting, and go and make your voices heard. We've got to fight at a grassroots level, and we're up against a lot of things. We're up against Twitter and Facebook. We're up against um, nine-tenths of the media. Uh, we're up against unions. This, we've let this go too far. It's a, it's a, we're behind. It's, it's the ninth inning, and we're down by six runs. But we still have an inning left to rally and fight. I think with God on our side, I don't believe America's doomed. So that's my message to you. Um, I don't want to guilt you. If you didn't do anything wrong, it happened very fast. It, it seems to happen overnight after the election. And, um, but now we gotta wake up from our stupor and say, if I have a breath in my body, I'm going to do something to save America. Thank you very much. And uh, is there time for questions? Or we yeah, ready? we have time for questions. If you have any questions for me, I, or discussion, or it, believe me, if you wanna disagree with me, that's completely fine. We can, I think, I think there's certainly room for that. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, do you believe that by now the opposition is fair? One of my questions that I have is do you believe that the opposition is actually Turn your mic on. Hello. 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 Hello? Yeah, perfect. Okay, the question I have is, in your professional opinion, do you believe that the opposition, and realizing this is kind of a generic term, is it being coordinated at the highest level? Yes, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's backward meetings. I, I think that there's generally a consensus that has come amongst all the different groups involved. The, the teachers unions, the, uh, the other unions, the, the left of the political figures, uh, the CNN. I mean, I, if I could blame almost anything, I think, you know, I have a business partner that loves to watch CNN. And if he gets to, to the office before me, we're watching CNN for the day. And so sometimes I listen to CNN. I mean, that's a, that's a propaganda or it, it, all day long, they, they're, they're telling people how racist America is, how dangerous America is, how dangerous Republicans are. And so I think it is being coordinated, but I don't think they have like some of these. I, I, I think there's just a consensus. I, I saw it happen in San Diego, where seemingly overnight, um, my sandbag meetings went from being fairly balanced to being completely unbalanced. They, they took all Republicans off all committees. They silenced our voices. They, they, we have no voice there any longer. And we're just overrun. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think it's organized, but it's happening organically. And, and 
I don't know if this is true or not, but the Christian part of me thinks that there's they, that kind of leads to demonic activity in that because it's happening so coordinatedly and so quickly. Okay, we have another question. Bill, um, what's your top topic? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, we have four, four different areas that need to be addressed in our country. First of all, our, our, we can't get our government to work together. That's a, that's a major. The Republican and Democratic Party are not working together at all. I don't, think, I don't think they will. They, and the Republican Party is not doing what you said from the Christian basis of the foundation. They're not doing their job either, that part, in supporting our country and our president that was. We have a group called Black Lives Matter. That in those those individual people are destroying the foundational biblical principles of our country. Then we have another one called Antifa. I'm giving you these, and I'll let you respond to them. Okay. We have another one called Antifa. So that group has uh, an agenda of destroying, tearing down the home, the family, the Christian foundation, the statues, and anything and everything that they can to address what you just said long ago. And the last part is the Christians in America will not step up to the plate and do what they need to do to take care of the problem. That's the biggest issue. Of course it is, but you can't rely on people who come to church who are told not to fight, not to hurt, not to destroy, not to do. And then those individual people go home and then tell them to go out and march in the streets. They don't want to do that. It's not in their Christian biblical foundational principles and how they live their life. And now we have leadership. We have leadership in our country. Those leaders are not doing their job. And when these people do what they're doing, they should be, and the law enforcement is being broken apart, right? So if the law enforcement is being broken apart, who can we rely on rather than say, Christians, go take your banners and go march in the street? We tried that, and they crucified the president. Understand? So what we're doing is we're getting crucified no matter where we turn. Like you said, they just shut you down. The question is, address some of that. Well, I don't I don't have an easy answer as to how we how we get there. Uh, my, my gut instinct is marching in the streets will probably just bring violence. Um, I think it's more I think it's more simple than that, or in cities. I, I think um, a good place to start would be for, for Christians to put a little time and effort into studying what's happening in their own backyard. What's, like, we, had a, we, we had a school district, uh, the Mesa Spring Valley School District, where they were not wanting the kids to come back to school, and they were saying that anybody who wanted the kids to come back to school was a uh, white supremacist. <laughs> and, that's a really scary thing because because what they did they they changed the argument. The, the argument was, is it good for children to be in school? Is it good for children not to wear masks? Is it safe? And they immediately switch it over to a racial problem where it's very difficult to because now you're if, if if you say wait a second no it's ridiculous to call people white supremacists. Now you've got the argument of, are you saying that there's no racism in America? Are you saying that we don't have a racist history? And, and now you're just in the weeds fighting about racism. But you're not going to win that argument because there's so many hurt feelings. There, there's so much damage because they're right. There has been some horrible things done in the name of racism in our country. There's been horrible things done in the name of racism in every country. But... <clears throat> But anyway, I so to answer your question, I still think we've got to find a way to reach Christians and get them to take some ownership and do something. And also, we have an election coming up in 18 months. 13% um, of Christians voted for Biden. And Biden was not the guy he said he was going to be. He's been the most radical president in the history of the United States. So we have got to talk to our friends. <laughs> I have relatives that, that are old, died in the wool, Michigan, auto manufacturing Democrats. And they still vote Democrat, you know, but they're still Christian. I got to move on. And, and I think we got to talk to those people and say, wait a second, at what point 
can you sever yourself from the, the Democrat Party? Are you willing to lose America over it? Yes, sir. You, you know, one of the one of the things that I always know is that Jesus turned over the money lender the tables of money lender. Uh, and so I don't think Jesus was turning the other sheep. Uh, so I think that uh, Christians actually do need to get motivated. They need to either donate their time or their money. Unfortunately, that message does not seem to resonate. So Floyd was Floyd was right. There's there's been a a lot of effort put in to churches to say, let's not talk about hell. Let's not talk about sin. Let's just talk about Jesus and love and, and you know, we're all going to get along. And, that's not and, and, and But, you know, people can change, too. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. When I did the meeting, uh, what uh, some of our friends have already said it, but the one point I picked from your speech is that every American has got to do something to put American right or to make the place better for us to live in. Yes. There's a lot more things which is going on. It, it's like we are coming from better to worse uh, because of racism. To me, in front of God, we are all the same. What makes us the same is the blood. If you cut your blood and I cut mine, they all flow red. Yes. That is the cardinal point. And it's, it's the, the, the whole issue will be on you, the leaders of America. You people who are our leaders in America has got to do something. You have got to wake up. You have got to put in place what the people should do to make the place better. Uh, uh, what I see as very important is the church. The church has a lot of things to do. They have got to participate. We should not only come to the church to pray to God, which is correct, but there should be a way that the church should let the people understand that we are all the same. Because the church is bigger than any other person on, on, in, in America here. And the church is everywhere. So if we start from the church that a certain minute of time is given for the priest, for the pastor, to say something about how people should live, that will take us more. That's what I am thinking. Because look at the killing of the rampant uh, killing of people in America these days. Every day we are hearing about that. You know, people have, somebody has picked a gun and has killed people for no good reason. You know, this is not even racism. This is just somebody picking the gun. And to me, I've been looking at the kind of people who were killed. These are young people from 30 years downwards. Why would the government allow somebody from 30 years downward who doesn't know about humanity? To be to, to, to be sold again. Why would a 25 year child, a 23 or a 25, who does not know that the human being matters, be allowed to buy a gun? So these are the things which is making the place very, very difficult to live in. So I said the church and everybody is supposed to be involved. But you, the leaders, the more, because the more people die in this country, we blame it on the leaders. It looks like you are not doing much. It looks like you are not guiding the people what they should do. I agree with you. Thank you. I, I want to address what you said because I, I totally agree with you. Um, a lot of people know that I stood up against um, shutdowns when, when coronavirus started. I, I took a stand against shutdowns because I didn't believe it, it was the right thing to do. I, 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 yes. <laughs> But I was naive because when I stood up and said enough's enough, and what I said was our police department wasn't going to enforce these laws uh, about mask wearing and not letting people in restaurants and things like that. I assume that you know, there's like seven or eight other mayors, in the, there's 18 mayors in the city, in the county. There's about seven, maybe eight, that uh, are like minded with me. And I figured most of those guys would, would see me stand up on the news and they'd be having press conferences the next day too. But for months and months and months and months, none of them stood up. And I know why. There's a lot of fear. And it's very... Fear is Yeah. And it's, it's very human, but it's... We don't... 
but you're not living in a time where you can protect yourself like that. It, 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 American politicians, they like the power. Being the mayor of a city, there's a lot. It doesn't pay much. But you know what? Everybody's nice to you. You don't get tickets. They, there's always a parking space ready for you. Everybody's you know, shaking your hands like Mr. Bear. And it, it feels good. And a lot of people say, you know what? I don't want to give that up. I, I want to make sure I win the next election. So when, when somebody says, hey, you should stand up against what's happening, they're like, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's a little dangerous. I might, get, I might lose the next election. I might offend somebody. And I'm saying, we're way past that. You know, if, if, the, if you're on a plane and the, the, the pilot has lost his mind and you're heading down into the ground, you don't, you don't say, well, I can fly the plane, but I don't want to offend him. I, I, I'm not going to bother him. You know, you know, we're, we're flying towards the ground and we're going to explode. And so that's my commitment. Um, I don't care what happens to me politically. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to say the truth, at least the truth that I believe. And uh, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't say that for you, Doctor. Thank you very, very much. I want you to join me. You talk about the pastors need to speak up. I agree with you, but they're not going to do it unless we sit down with the pastor and say, Pastor. Why aren't you doing something? You, you've got this massive influence, and, and you're not talking. Why? Would you think Jesus would just allow something like this to happen without saying anything? And uh, you know, we have to approach people in love. We can't we can't point fingers at somebody. But all of you have people in your life, like Pastor Jeremy said, in your oikos, 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 <laughs> that. Are perpetuating these problems, and they, you know, some of them trust you, and you're gonna say, "Wait a second, we're not, we're, we're not the racist nation that they say we are. We, do, we don't want to go towards communism. Communism caused the deaths of a hundred million people in the 20th century. We don't want to do that. You got two minutes? Okay. Um, I have this bad problem uh, habit of talking too long, but. Hey, one more question before I. Uh... Anyone else? Yeah. I, okay, I just wanted to share one thing about the media. What I see, you know, as far not even just social media, we're just talking about the news and the newspapers, and it seems like it's geared towards eighteen to twenty-two year olds or maybe younger. And once upon a time, they said the newspaper was written for like eighth graders, you know. And I think that. It's like the dumbing down of America I see happening. And I just feel like as Christians, we need to raise up our kids and our grandkids, and we need to teach them like adults, not like what the media wants them to be, 13 year olds. That's you my know, opinion. The last thing I want to say is that besides school board meetings, you should be meeting with your, the principals of your kids and grandkids school and say, are, are you indoctrinating the children with Critical race theory. Are you indoctrinating the children with hatred? Are, are you telling white kids that, that, that they're inherently intrinsically bad because they're white? They should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, are, are you helping one race of kids to hate another race of kids and that race of kids to hate the other? If you are, stop. And if you don't stop, I want to lead an effort to get you removed. So they'll. I, I was raised in, in North Carolina, and I came up in a time where other people had their own fountain, we had our own fountain, but it's been a long time. But in all my years, I've never, ever, in my heart, I've never had a racial thought about anyone. It's just not in my makeup. When I was a young kid, our home, we were so poor, we lived in a colored neighborhood, and, and I learned to love and respect and, and play with them. They were my best friends. Okay, so let us get that out of the way. In, in El Cajon right now, we have a serious situation going on right now with poverty in, on the streets. We have people by the hundreds on the streets. And you and I talked about it just briefly at the office one time. So what I'd like to do is, what can we do to get these people off the streets that are breaking, they broke into my place a month ago, 
Um, have you heard? I told you about it. Yeah. I broke into my place and stole all my guns. Do we have time to address this or? They stole well, all, all my guns and all my collectibles, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the point. And nothing's being done about it. So nobody's called me in a month. Okay? Well, I, I disagree with, with you that nothing's being done. I just came from a dedication at the East County Transitional Movie Center of a new a dormitory to house 200 people. Uh, the problem is that there is a group of people on the streets that because of drugs and alcohol, because of a lifestyle, you can offer them a bed every day of the week and they're gonna turn you down. I, and I say this not just for being a bear, I spent 25 years working in a hospital emergency room doing psychiatric evals. So I, I know these people and there is a group of folks that will not get off the street. We have over 600 people that are housed that, that were homeless and we've got them permanent housing, but there's about 150 people on the streets right now that just refuse every effort. And the, the laws in the state of California say you can't arrest them, you can't move them, you can't take their stuff. You, you, and and we, we're in such a liberal state that they've protected homelessness. I mean, and believe me, I am pushing things to the I shouldn't say it out loud, but. I know you are. But, but as the mayor, as the mayor, don't you have the power and authority to override that and say, no. it's right for my city? No. It's right now. No, they, I'm, I'm already uh, under investigation with the ACLU. I'm already uh, under investigation with the grand jury. They 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 bother me all the time because I, I won't allow tents on the street. I won't allow uh, sleeping bags on the street. You go down, to, go down to the ballpark in San Diego. That's what they want. Miles and miles of tents and poverty. It looks like Bangladesh. So it's oh, that's another big problem. America has a boatload of problems right now. But frankly, my focus has gone off of homelessness and more on to this civil unrest because I think that's uh, really the main problem right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And for those on Zoom, I know we had one quick question I just wanted to ask the mayor. Sure. Um, I'll have to read it. It's a long one. Oh, sorry. But again, thank you for all your wisdom. Okay, this is the most vital. This is the most vital presentation. Thank you so much. I'm a history teacher. Repespierre proved that the French Revolution was not intended to empower the common people. In the USA, extremists on both sides, not just the left or our political spectrum, are destroying the majority middle. Your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, I can see what you're saying about that. You know, I think extremism is probably a bad thing on, on either side. Um, and that's, I also believe that it's a bad idea to have one party rule no matter what. Even if, even if uh, my guys could have you know, the House and the Senate and and the presidency, uh, there's a part of me who would enjoy that, but frankly, I don't think it would be healthy. I look what's happening in, in California right now with complete one party rule, and California has descended into chaos. And I think a part of that, a lot of reason that for that is that we've destroyed the normal checks and balances, and the one party has uh, passed laws that have made it more difficult for the other party to ever have any kind of influence. And um, one party rule leads to totalitarianism, in my uh, view. But thank you for the question. I think it's a good question. Thank you very much. And again, I thank everyone for participating in our Entrepreneur for Christ class. Next week, we have a great speaker, Ashley uh, Cheeks, will be here again talking about business plans. And she always gives us lots of insights about the formalities of trying to get that earnest money that we need from our outside assistance. And again, thank you, Mayor. Thank, Heavenly, you. thank you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the time and the goodness that you give us each day and the words of wisdom spoken here, Lord. I pray that each one of us will pray upon the, the, um, the needs that we need to seek for from you as we help our, our cultural 
problems here in the United States, Lord, and going outward into the world. As Christians, we do want to honor you, Lord, and walk um, and follow with you um, and not just try to do things in our own will, Lord. I just pray that you just guide us and just give us the words that we need to speak to our leaders and our political systems and our schools, Lord. And I just pray for all the children and families that are represented here in this room and in this church building, Lord. Skyline has so many new children coming. I pray for those precious families, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.